Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, Towards 2025, Reducing Carbon Emissions from Aviation. I'm Professor Tim Riley, Head of Griffith Aviation, and I'm also chairing the Air Travel Emissions Reduction Working Group. Uh, and, and it's this work which I'm going to talk about today. So just to get the webinar kick-started and get you to start thinking about things, there is already a, a question there about whether you're keen to reduce your uh, work air travel. Uh, be honest there, uh, whether you are or not. But I just want to get you to start thinking about these uh, three emergent research questions. So have a think about them and start putting um, any answers you have in the Q&A section. And we'll come back to that later on. So the rough time frame, I'll speak for around about half an hour, and then we'll have 20 to 30 minutes for chat there. So in terms of the questions, I'll give my quick uh, responses. Uh, what challenges does Griffith face to reduce uh, air travel emissions? Uh, to me, the challenges are basically international travel is core to our business, international students and staff, and research links with conferences and other research visits as well. In terms of how can we overcome them to meet our targets of 25% reduction of air travel by 2025, 20, there are a number of ways which I'll, I'll outline through the decision making process, carbon calculation, uh, more online conferences um, and other ways. Lectures, uh, many of us have already gone to uh, online conferences. Um, it's a very different environment we are from even a year ago. I'm actually in N78 on Nathan campus. Um, I'm used to being in here for large seminars and events, and I'm basically in this room with, with a couple of tech people. So it's very strange um, not having that interaction with an audience. Um, we're used to now Teams meetings, Zoom meetings. Um, so hopefully they'll be a bit more immersive, responsive and interactive in the near future. But it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. So for this webinar content, um, I'm looking to outline the university and working group approach to the reduction in aviation emissions challenge. I'm then going to give a bit of background into research into aviation and climate change. And finally, moving forward to practical steps uh, for reducing aviation emissions at Griffith University. Um, I'm honoured and excited to be leading this working group as head of Griffith Aviation. We're one of the leading uh, aviation units in Australia. Uh, and in, indeed, we have more students than any other aviation unit um, in Australia. And also, this brings together the, the lead uh, in climate change as well at the university uh, through the beacon and other ways as well. OK, so I'll just talk through some of the, the background um, to the university and the, and the working group. This work actually comes from um, the university uh, sprint report. Um, but actually, I'll just quickly go back and, and give my, my background. Um, I've been at Griffith University for five years now, uh, but I've actually been working on transport based research for more than 25 years. Increasingly, it became aviation focused in the UK and increasingly environmental focused. So one of my main research themes now is decarbonising the aviation industry. Um, and I've always had this focus on being interdisciplinary in my approach. So a geography degree, a PhD based in economics and statistics, but something like aviation is very contemporary. There's always something in the news and I'm always interested in, in real world problems. So in the UK, before I came out here, between about 2008, 2014, there was a lot of research going on, of which I, I led some of it, on reducing environmental emissions from surface transport as well as air transport. So these projects, one was uh, looking at reducing um, aviation emissions in terms of trips to and from airports in the behavioural change project to the left. The second one was actually part of an adaptation research and resilience to climate change project called FutureNet. So we were looking at, at how behaviourally uh, people might reduce um, emissions. Um, that project was in between Glasgow and London and ways of that. And also a large surface transport project on demand responsive transport, uh, which is actually a theme um, under Matt Burke's transport research group, uh, which is carrying on today at Griffith. So I'm interested in uh, real world problems. Um, aviation and climate change I've been working on for just about uh, 10 or 12 years now. Um, and it's something that always comes back as being very contentious, 
people saying, what is sustainable aviation? You get some people wanting you to do more in terms of reducing flights and some people um, arguing strongly the other way and we should just carry on as we are because of the importance of air travel. So in terms of the university approach, there is um, this sprint report, which um, led by Brandon Mackey, um, about getting Griffiths um, to be net zero emissions by 2050 um, and having this kind of 45, 50% reduction um, against the 2010 baseline. So the, the main strategies are avoiding emissions, uh, reducing emissions and generating and pushing clean energy. So where aviation emissions come in, there's avoiding it by not traveling by air, Maybe also carrying on flying, but being able to reduce the emissions through the emissions from the aircraft chosen, the airline chosen, or the so-called high load factors of, of the flight that's taken. So more people on the flight means less carbon emissions per person. So in terms of that zero emission report, um, they're then having a reduction target of 25% by 2030. And indeed for aviation, trying to push it 25% by 2025, which is, uh, for me, basically, we need to reduce our emissions. Um, and in these uncertain COVID times, it, it's hard to know how quickly things will bounce back. Uh, but certainly there is a need to uh, reduce emissions with significant behavioural change by university staff. Indeed, after energy consumption, the largest source of Griffith University's emissions is from air travel. Uh, estimate from 2017-18 data is 15%. So certainly it is a huge chunk of the emissions generated by university staff. So the working group that I'm chairing, we're looking to um, an implementation plan uh, to be developed by April next year. And we're going to consult with the university community about it. So it'd be great to have your thoughts as we go along today and those of you that, that get involved in our data collection effort. So in terms of where we sit in the university, there's a sustainability subcommittee uh, that was uh, that, that's ongoing, and we're one of three working groups spinning off that. So I'm chairing the Aviation Emissions Reduction Working Group, um, and the other two relating to biodiversity and the SDGD goals have uh, webinars this week as well. So in, in this working group, there's a group of us um, on it. Uh, Svini Caldera is the researcher on it. Uh, Boyana is uh, an aviation lecturer. Um, and then Diane Smith um, on the administration, uh, leading the, the travel team and an administrative support from Saffron Benner. We also have Emma Whittlesey, um, who's been seconded from uh, the government, state government to, to GIFT um, and, it, and is returned back to, to the government, but is still providing input. So that's our, our, our small team and we've been tasked with developing an implementation plan with options to achieve uh, the target 25% uh, by 2025 and, and hopefully we can we can do it as a university and a team. So we're going to consult in a number of ways. So we have three data collection um, efforts. We're going to have stakeholder interviews with uh, key administrators, frequent flyers and key bookers. Then our main data collection is going to be an immersive discussion platform towards the end of this year. And then finally, we'll, we'll, we'll fine tune and test with some staff focus groups early next year uh, and then finish um, April for then um, implementation plan to be rolled out across the university. So before turning to uh, aviation climate change based research, I just want to come back to that first question and challenges to reduce um, aviation emissions. And I, I briefly spoke on this on Monday at, at the initial round table. Uh, but one of the really challenges challenges it, is its core to our business. So we have international students. I know there's a blip at the moment with COVID-19, but they're a core part of our business, um, as well as a lot of international staff. Uh, we have to recruit staff and students and go out and make visits. And then research activities, conferences is, is the most common trip um, by air travel by the university. And then field trips, research visits and the like. Then we have connection issues. The tyranny of distance is, is um, is about the location of Australia with the rest of the world. So it does encourage air travel to um, collaborators in Asia and beyond Europe, Americas and elsewhere. Indeed, domestically, um, although there are sometimes road and rail op um, opportunities, they're often uh, not, not long enough or take too long. Um, so we're often required for, for air travel um, locally. And then there are the contentious aspects. It's a real challenge. Um, I'll show a bit later um, how difficult it is to get people to change 
Um, and the fact that clearly aviation is not environmentally sustainable, but it is arguably economically and socially sustainable. Um, so that's one of the real, real challenges there. So now we'll turn to some um, of the research in aviation and climate change. So the, the real need for reducing aviation emissions is that emissions from greenhouse gases from civil aviation have tripled over the last 30 years. And this growth, although debatable how, how and when it will come back, it's still expected to continue post COVID-19 with an underlying growth in air travel demand. There are a range of complexities associated with the calculation of the aviation contribution. Uh, there's radiative forcing and there's a debate in, in the actual emissions um, generated from air travel, as well as complexities with the policy response. Uh, there's, there's carbon offsetting question marks over that, but also th there are uh, issues over tax, such as the air passenger duty in the UK, and issues over uh, government response. That there was contentious debate about aviation inclusion in the EU emissions trading scheme. And there's also a, a, an industry proposed um, Corsia as well. So if we take a step back and look at um, air travel um, between 1970 and 2018, and this is a classic slide from one of my lectures, um, that you see the, the incredible growth in aviation over the last 30, 40 years. Globally, you see the slight dip after 9-11 and the global financial crisis in, in 2008 onwards. So a slight dip for a couple of years. Now, clearly under COVID-19, that dip is going to go far deeper um, and it's unclear how and much it will bounce back. But I, I would estimate that at some point, three to five years, we'll be back at, at where we were um, in 2020. Very hard to predict moving forward. And please don't come back to me in three to five years to see where we're actually going to be. So in terms of looking forward, um, I come back to this um, conclusion of a book I co-edited um, on transport and climate change. And this was co-written in uh, 2012 with a collaborator, Lee Chapman. Um, and it was all aspects of transport and climate change. And I, I contribute to the aviation chapter, but the hardest part to write was the last paragraph, because looking forward, it's very hard to go between a pessimistic to an optimistic um, approach. And, and this paraphrases what, what that last couple of paragraphs were saying, and, and it's relevant today. Again, we need an early response uh, to minimising climate change costs. You can argue that society is running out of time to avoid dangerous climate change level. Um, the downturn is a concern, and this was written after the GFC, and there was a concern then. Um, and the concern now coming out of the um, COVID-19 is that climate change will take a lower policy priority. Clearly, there's going to be economic focus, Clearly, there's going to be a jobs focus um, and, and there's a big debate out there about the impact um, of climate change against those um, economic perspective. I do remember trying to get the balance right in that conclusion about the, the, the element of hope underneath it. That, uh, and you kind of bit of hope that the climate change impacts have been overestimated, uh, perhaps that policymakers will suddenly change track on climate change issues and further unexpected behavioural and technological changes uh, will, will occur. Now, there have been some since 2012, and there's been further development in, in aircraft. Um, there's some behavioural change. There's the so-called flight shaming movement coming out of uh, Scandinavia. There's the climate change movement with Greta Thunberg um, and others. And you can actually argue that perhaps a change with a more climate change focus will come from a grassroots bottom-up approach rather than a top-down um, policy approach. But we'll wait and see with that. Um, I actually come back to this slide behaviourally. I, I know it's dated from 20, 2008, but the work I was involved with between that 2008-2012 period, there was actually quite a low, lot of work undertaken by the UK government and research in the UK, um, probably less before and since, to be honest. Um, but it, that uh, work that I show here from a government report surveys a huge uh, swathe of, of the UK population and looked at 12 um, unsustainable behaviours and the willingness of people to change their behaviour. Now air travel highlighted in red in the top left was one of the 12. The other two in that quadrant are surface transport, um, but the axes are about willingness to change behaviour high and low and the carbon impact high and low. So what it shows there effectively um, is that of the 12 practices and, and one of the ones on the, the, the far right is increasingly cycling. So basically air travel had the most impact in terms of carbon and also it was one of the ones that people are 
least resistant to change. And that's one of the real challenges is, is that of all the unsustainable practices, air travel is the one that people are least willing to let go. So I've just got a, a few themes that have come out from the literature. Um, I, I do kind of remember this first one, partly because of the title about um, sustainable transport academics being the elephant in the room. Um, and I'm as guilty as the next uh, person in, in terms of going out to, to conferences. Um, and the fact that air, university air travel is starting to come under the spotlight uh, from the literature. You've had some academics signing up to not, not travel by air for conferences. Um, so it is a growing academic debate. And one of the hopes from this um, work for the university at Griffith is that it, it will spawn some uh, useful academic research. The second one um, is about voluntary carbon offsetting. Uh, the airlines still focus on this. Indeed, a uh, um, Griffith University event uh, a month ago with the Qantas CEO, um, Alan Joyce, um, proclaimed Qantas as being one of the leading airlines because they had 10% carbon offsetting. Now, um, there's also been a lot of debate about the impacts of carbon offsetting. I quote from a paper here by uh, Griffith authors Brendan Mackey and Suzanne Beckham, um, but there's a debate about how much uh, people are willing to carbon offsetting, willing to carbon offset, but also the impact of carbon offsetting has on reducing carbon emissions. So it generates a lot of debate, but there are real question marks over the impacts. Another one um, is actually some work that I was involved with uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, and at the time, there was a real question mark about air passenger duty um, in the UK. So that's a tax on flights. Um, in and out of the UK, very contentious. And there was an argument that that money was going to environmental improvements, but it wasn't clear from the government whether that where that money was actually going. So I remember leading that focus group work where there were people were saying, well, where's that going? It's a black hole. Um, so in terms of this work at the university here, trust and transparency, like in that study, is just as relevant here. So we have to have buy-in from the whole university community that uh, they trust what's going to happen. There's a clear transparency uh, that we're all in this together effectively uh, in developing these uh, reduction policies. There is a real strong environmental ethos in the university, and I'm really hopeful that we can be a leader in this, this kind of cross, uh, cross aviation environment um, problem um, and moving forward as a solution. There has been a recent paper, um, a Nature comment paper, um, about solutions such as conferences. Um, this, this one comments on um, an AAG conference, which is an international geography based conference, and actually suggests one way of maybe rather than having one big international conference in the year, you split it into more three regional ones, so that arguably one in, in Europe and America and, and Asia. So people travel less far to go to those regional events, and then you have different hookup events in different time zones. So there are some solutions emerging. Um, such as regional conferences, and like um, the debate about academic travel, it's, it's only growing um, in these kind of COVID times and then post-COVID times. So now for the final part of the webinar, I'll just summarise uh, some of the data that we have and where we're looking to go uh, with this work. So we've only been going a couple of months uh, with this, this work. Uh, we actually have data for the last 10 years um, in air travel from the university. Um, naturally, we'll, we'll keep it all in confidence that there's the ethical background being covered. But effectively, in 2019, which is a really good base year, given the COVID impacts really kind of, well, it happened really in March, but it had been brewing from, from January onwards, that there were actually 25,430 flights on Griffith University business last year. And that's single flights, so clearly most of them will be return flights. Um, but I've just drawn out three main uh, summary pieces of information from that data. So it's quite evenly split across the university. There's data on research centres and units and groups, but it's fairly evenly split across the four main university groups. Then you have the travel by Griffith International who have to go out and recruit um, students. So they clearly have some work. And naturally, you've then got the central corporate um, business for the university. So we need to cover all of those elements um, accordingly with the implementation. And that we're all in this together, so you don't get people looking at each other and saying, well, I'm doing my bit and you're not doing your bit. So that was quite interesting just to get a, a breakdown on that. The second interesting finding from an initial trawl of that data was the trip type. So 
Um, I expected a, a lower percentage uh, domestic, but actually 42% of those flies were domestic within Australia. Now, we kind of understand clearly that, that um, flying is arguably the only realistic option uh, to Sydney and, and Melbourne. Um, but it'd be interesting moving forward whether that's an easier one to, to uh, reduce. Um, although clearly per flight there's less emissions because it's less far um, to travel. Although you can then get in the debate about uh, the aircraft and, and, and that kind of thing as well. So finally, the, the um, top three airlines that, that, that we used were, were Qantas, uh, then Virgin Australia and Singapore Airlines. So interestingly, from an aviation perspective, the, the lack of low cost airlines used. Now, at the moment, it's, there isn't much difference between environmental performance between different um, airlines. Some of them do look at environmental performance and market accordingly um, to, to that. Certainly some of the, the ones using your aircraft do that. Um, so at the moment, there, there isn't really in terms of that choice, but maybe down the track, we'll look at environmental performance of flights or airlines and, and book accordingly. Now, I suspect that some of the choice of, of Qantas um, and Virgin Australia are related to frequent flyer points and business lounges. So it'll be interesting to, to kind of tease out some of that and whether that could be a, lev a, lev a lever to, um, to link that to environmental um, performance and, and behaviour. So that's an interesting one to see. And uh, yeah, watch this space. So we've um, come up with some initial options. Uh, we've groups according to university planning and procurement, uh, supporting infrastructure, uh, university options, and research and teaching practice. So one of the things that, that we've started doing is looking around uh, for university best practice. We want to be a leader in this area, uh, covering the, the, the link between aviation and, and climate change. Um, and Lund University, uh, in our initial trawl, has come across as the, having the strongest policies in, in this area. And they actually have a, a good document where they talk about a pre-trip approval decision tree. So that then when people are booking travel, um, there's a whole sequence in which they need to follow. Another approach is to have um, an emission dashboard. People can see um, maybe individually or group level uh, where they're traveling with a, with a dashboard. Uh, when you're looking at changing behavior, you have carrots and you have sticks. So it'd be great to encourage people to change as well as uh, forcing or, or, or strongly encouraging, I should say, people to change as well. Key to have enhanced carbon calculation. We have some general carbon figures uh, for those flights from 2019, um, but there is a lot of work on, on development of carbon calculation of air travel. So we, we want to enhance and improve that when calculating air travel emissions for the university. Um, we're then looking at flexible working arrangements. Clearly the COVID's had this impact of people working a lot more from home, uh, but then that might have more impacts on the air travel we make. So if someone's flying to a destination um, and then maybe a week later fly to another one, of having more flexibility of having maybe three trips or um, two as well. So that could be another um, option. In terms of supporting infrastructure, we need to make the most of these new technologies that are moving. Um, and we've had this kind of forced change with more Teams meetings, Zoom, um, and this rapid development through this disruption. Um, but we need to have more immersive opportunities, uh, more interactive opportunities. Um, certainly, we have new opportunities at Griffith University with the so-called DEN, so Digital Energy Node, rooms. Cheryl Desher in School of Engineering and Environment um, is responsible for, for these rooms and that could be a, a useful opportunity at Griffith University to develop um, this kind of conference and meeting behaviour to have them more interactive um, as well. University operations, um, performance indicators maybe, um, corporate rewards and awards. So again getting that balance between um, carrots and sticks um, but actually um, and again that balance is really um, important and that's been shown from a number of studies as well. If you have too many sticks people won't feel engaged and feel forced um, but if sometimes if you have too many um, carrots you won't get you won't get every, anything happening. So we're keen to get that right balance. And finally in terms of research and teaching practice um, a lot of us have been, uh, we've been doing a lot of online work at Griffith, which has been great to see, um, but a lot of, again, fast movement from trimester one onwards in blending teaching developments. So we've had to adapt more online in how we teach and what we do, um, and also online conference developments as well. Um, I went to my first online conference three months ago. It was better than I expected, 
Um, there's still some work to go clearly ab about um, immersiveness, um, getting that kind of networking event um, going, uh, which uh, I was talking to a Griffith University colleague a couple of days ago about how you would have that, that networking in between um, in between uh, conference events, um, network dinners or socials, where you go from one person to the next. And there are online tools that I sense are moving forward, um, but hopefully that we can take that um, advantage. And maybe even take on more in terms of putting on conferences and leading in that space as well. Okay, so next steps. Um, so we're a couple of months into this work. Uh, we're going to continue to examine that air travel data. Uh, we're looking to um, interview key stakeholders, probably five or ten of them over the next couple of months, and finalise those options. It'd be great to have your feedback in the chat to, to see what, what you think of that. Our main data collection effort is going to be towards the end of this year in October, November. Uh, we're using an immersive discussion platform called Recollective, which has been used by the university and a couple of other uh, research um, opportunities um, to try and test it. So I envisage that as a, it's kind of a week long um, event where participants maybe would have a couple of hours over that week at their, their convenience to come in and a bit like a focus group, give their ideas, give their thoughts, tag different events, um, use photos, so we can really build up some of these ideas. And then the third um, bit of data collection as mentioned before will be to have um, some more staff involvement through focus group to fine tune those events and then even beyond April when we finish our piece of work with the implementation there'll be a chance through the university processes to really fine tune and implement some of these. So it's exciting, um, it's ongoing and it's great to be part of this uh, Griffith sustainability development. Okay so that's my presentation, um, dead on half an hour so I've done that to time which is good to see. Um, so now I'm going to start looking through uh, the Q&A and respond. So thank you very much for your time in terms of listening to me. I'll now get on and have a look to see um, the responses accordingly. Okay, so I can see um, quite a few coming in the published and thank you very much for everyone for listening and for getting in vague. Um, so I've seen one about no longer meeting in person with people interstate. Uh, good to get some thumbs up for that one. I think for me, there's an interesting difference between travel with people you know and people you don't know. So certainly um, there's a different business meeting between a regular monthly meeting and an, a, a once a year. So that's quite, quite interesting to, to think about moving forward. So if you have, um, so for, for argument's sake, someone who um, has not been part of a team, wants to get out and meet people, um, and then having that regular meeting, you don't need to, to meet up with them if you know the people involved. Okay, another one, um, challenges about to say, air travel is a core part of um, yeah, what we do. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, 13 of you said, are you keen to reduce your business air travel? Thumbs up. Um, I'm just scrolling down. And some thumbs up for the, for the other ones. Okay, um, good comment here from Anonymous. What's the university stance on student mobility? Now, now clearly, when we're looking at, at reducing aviation emissions, it's always interesting what's included and not, not included. So I would like to see um, student travel considered or included um, to some degree. Um, it's something I'm keen to keep involved. So we could have something where, and I'd like to see it part of the implementation, if it's not in part of the university-based direct emissions, you could have encouraging students, when, if they've got to fly here to study, um, to take more environmentally uh, sustainable travel with which airline, which flights, uh, maybe provide them with incentives. So personally, and that's a, I've got to be careful what I say is my personal view and what's the university view, but I'm keen um, to have that as part of what we generate. And anyone involved, feel free to keep pushing me on that student perspective because it's clearly an important part. Um, yes, um, an alternate form of travel like a night train for travelling interstate. 
Um, yeah, that's a great um, thumbs up. Um, sadly, high speed rail in Australia is behind other parts of um, the world, um, but hopefully um, there could be investment down the track. Um, it's quite a slow travel, but you could actually um, do that as part of alternative travel. Um, anonymous here with nine, nine thumbs up. One of the challenges is to change people's ideas. In some cases, staff are required used to attending conferences and traveling for work. Um, and I acknowledge that. I also acknowledge it's one of the, the circle perks of what we do. Um, and, and it seems a bit hard for someone like myself who's been to conferences to then say to the next generation or people coming through um, to reduce that. Uh, we are going through a, a large change and disruption. Um, so it is changing what we, we think. and we. In terms of change theory, there's this kind of um, unfreeze where, where everything's all a bit chaotic. Um, so we're still waiting to see how things will relate longer term and things will freeze again. Um, so we'll have to see what, what happens and people get used to um, a different way of working. Um, it will, we will see. I meant to make the point in the, the lecture part, or the, sorry, the talking part, um, about equity. So I'm conscious about different staff levels um, and I think um, we should encourage the travel team particularly for the more junior staff um, because it's more important at, at the early stage of academic career to get out and about and, and attend conferences and that whole networking um, phase more than maybe people like myself who've been in in, um, in academia for 15 20 years or so so I am keen to, to, to see differentiations on the equity in terms of um, academic career um, I'm also keen on the equity element in terms of um, gender. Um, I acknowledge there are elements that often uh, with people with family commitments have not been able to take advantage of that, that kind of conferencing element and getting out and about. Um, and it's making sure that the equity key, key part of what Griffith stands for and has as the family, that we also include that in our aviation um, emissions work. So any, any of those two comments, I'm keen to see part of what we do and keen to see more um, discussion on them. They are part of the options, even though um, they weren't in that summary table. What kind of behavioural change will the uni need from staff and what are some of the incentives that could be used to discourage people from flying? I think um, it's important that uh, and I, I've, I've um, studied behavioural change for many years, both from an economic perspective and a psychology perspective. And it needs a range of measures. Um, it needs um, cost and, and um, is often the one people mention first and often rightly so. Um, I, I think it's, and cost can come in different ways, um, whether um, giving um, a unit or individual cost incentives where, where, where that comes from, but say, well, if, if you don't fly this year, you get an X amount into your research account um, or as or as a unit, you could have um, targets. So you, you can have cost as either um, a stick or, or a carrot. Um, so that that's one. Um, but then you can get something more, more maybe awards or rewards um, as well to encourage people. Um, there is um, Thaler and Sunstein had the kind of nudge economics, as we may be aware of, where there's kind of um, more subtle ways of encouraging people um, to behave. It comes a lot from energy, but it's used in transport. So you may see on some of your energy bills, things like um, you're spending this on energy. People in um, your street are spending this, which may be less, less or more. Or So you could have um, maybe nudging on your unit or individually um, the amount of emissions you're using for aviation or other purposes and how that, that compares. So we, we can have a range of initiatives and, and I have that's not a comprehensive list of either stated in the slides or, um, or verbally. Are aviation students taught sustainable business and operating practice during their studies? Uh, yes, um, I've had the challenge in um, the UK and here of teaching people that want to be pilots um, about environmental issues and um, they, there has certainly been some, some questioning over the years, but certainly it's part of um, certainly my contemporary aviation management course. Um, I have one, one lecture on that, but sustainability threads through um, all parts of 
the university and comes um, in courses in different different ways and means. So I've seen it um, increase over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, but and I think as, as academics, linking research um, to teaching and what we do is, is really important. So I, I bring in research examples as well. And indeed, some of those slides that I've shown today come from teaching. So the academic model where, where you're teaching informs research, informs teaching um, is important. And um, the, the industry, um, I kind of joke, has been slow to the party. Um, it's almost been dragged to the party, you could say, in some, in some extent. But, but certainly the envir environmental importance is, is growing and, and industry is, is acknowledging it in, in, certain, in certainly some parts. Um, great question from Maureen. Um, does GE consider emissions in travel booking? Um, it doesn't at the moment, but um, that's the hope moving forward that we do. We have the booking system with uh, CTM um, and we're certainly looking into the CTM approach who links with other government organisations. So actually, I'm, I'm hoping that Griffith can be a, a university leader in this way, not just so other universities can see best practice, but then also what we what we do will influence other government um, bodies. So if, if you're an organisation or a business in a certain area, are you a leader or a follower? So I really hope that we are a leader um, in this area. We're certainly a leader in, in aviation through Griffith Aviation. And we're certainly leader in climate change and environmental issues from our history and the climate action beacon. So um, great, great comment. And, and I want to see that that coming through in what we do. What are the barriers um, to alternative energy sources and fuels um, being used in aviation? Um, a quick plug for um, an event tomorrow, um, three o'clock. Um, GIFT, the Institute for Tourism and Griffith Aviation have been running um, a three, um, three, three, three series event called Aviation Reimagined. And it kind of stems out of a lot of work in electric aviation. I've been involved in some, and Emma Whittlesey has as well. And um, that's got a lot of international experts coming along. That's 3 p.m. tomorrow. But, but that, that work and, and other work, the, the challenge that you have in aviation is that it's one of the few um, unsustainable practices where there isn't a real alternative fuel um, source. Um, electric vehicles are further ahead of electric aviation. Um, you've got challenges with uh, the costs and, and the battery life. And even where you can use electric aviation and the seaplanes in Vancouver, um, there is actually some potential for some parts of Queensland actually, where you've got, you need to have short flights at the moment um, and links uh, may, may be there in some of the regional locations in Queensland. Um, some remoter parts of um, Scandinavia um, would possibly work as well. Um, but the, the technical aspect of the fuels um, make it a real barrier. Um, there's the whole, not just the, the battery, which is obviously the first place people look at, but also the refueling elements. Um, and at the moment, it, it's going to be small aircraft for a while. I'm always a bit careful because I'm not a technical expert, um, but, but it is um, something that, that we're interested in following. Uh, and, uh, and there should be, um, and with, with Emma, we're trying to um, develop ideas in electric aviation for, for Queensland. So that, that's exciting moving forward. Uh, but the challenge in aviation, people have pointed the finger as well, is that there isn't um, a major alternative um, fuel at the moment. Okay, Maureen, another great question. Um, our location bubbles for conferences a thing. We travel to Sydney, Melbourne a lot. Shift to local. Yeah, certainly the the bubbles is, is a big. Um, the whole issue with barriers and bubbles is a big political um, comment. Um, and I think with um, with travel to Sydney, Melbourne, um, it should shift to um, local. There, there is. I mean, I like the over, over, overnight train. Um, coincidentally, that the, the um, Sydney to Melbourne is the second or third most frequented route in the world. Um, and there has been resistance from a lot of the airlines about getting high speed rail between Sydney and Melbourne. So that is clearly politically something that, that could, um, could change mid to long term. So you could see travel between Sydney and Melbourne dramatically reduced. I have a, I'm actually leading a um, construction waste project. Um, I, do, I do a number of different things um, and that's linked with RMIT. 
Um, and that's been going a year. I've not been down to RMIT and I've not been up to, to um, Brisbane and that's worked well um, through um, online. And, and, and at the start of that project, there was talk about kind of being, being there in person both ways. So you can certainly do that um, locally. Um, so yeah, another good, good question. So why isn't um, carbon offsetting a viable system for reducing carbon emissions? Um, my view is it can help, but it kind of muddies the, the debate, particularly when you have low uptake. And also there's that big question on what happens to the um, to the money, where it goes and what and, and, and where you're doing with that, that carbon. I mean, there's been a whole debate over the years about planting a tree. Well, what difference does it actually make? Um, and, and to do it properly, it needs a proper carbon system accreditation. Um, so it's quite a, um, there's quite a few question marks. One is um, that people rush to it straight away. Um, another is um, airlines often push it as, as a way they're doing, not just, not just in aviation, but elsewhere. So it, it certainly helps is my view, um, but I'm getting a strong steer, certainly from Brendan and others about not going down that route. Um, and I can see it a bit from, from the literature as well. So my view, personal view is it can help, uh, but we need to look at other ways. And I think with this whole problem, it is a complex problem, but it needs a range of different solutions. Okay. I'm always conscious of time. I've got um, about 15 minutes left and I can see great questions coming through. So thank you very much. I do really appreciate that. So this year, people have become more comfortable with navigating an online and digital world. Will these online practices continue, especially when it comes to long distance inter-regional interstate meetings? Um, yeah, I think it, it will continue. I do remember um, there'll be an interesting how much travel bounces back. Um, there is a whole surface transport debate uh, about the commute average. This was UK data, but it's same here. It's always been about half an hour. And the idea about people being stuck in um, in their homes all the time and need to get out for go for a walk or, or go for travel. And I do think that, that pent up demand, at, not just for general travel, but then also um, conferences and meetings, there'll be an extent of that of people wanting to, once they, they get back to a new normal, there may be some of that people wanting to, to get out and about. So that, that'll be an interesting debate. I do think that for general business meetings, the routine and the one-off um, will be a difference. Um, clearly with conferences and international events, some will be better at doing online than others. Um, so some disciplines, um, I mean, ha having been someone who's worked across engineering and science and um, everyone has their own different conferencing, conference practices, some are more sustainable than others. So we just see that, that difference. Um, I've also had um, two new staff in aviation start in the last six months, recruited last year before the, the um, ban on, on um, recruitment um, and the whole issue of had to be in quarantine and, and we've had new starters that, that have, have started working without actually meeting people so we're trying to occasionally get people to to interact with appropriate social distancing so it, it's to, to me it's it, it there will be a difference between routine and you as well what kind of advances and changes are happening on aviation emissions in other countries like australia um, and what lessons can we um, learn from them? There is certainly more of, um, and I'm trying not to, um, I tend to lean towards what's happening in the UK given I've worked there and know that much, much, much more strongly. I, I think it leans a lot towards the policies and the people. So some, some um, countries are stronger than others. Um, unfortunately, Australia has been a bit slow to come to the party. Um, at, at times, um, I think I tend to look, I mean, academically, I look towards Scandinavia, um, look towards um, uh, the, the flight shaming movement in Scandinavia. Um, so I look towards uh, Northern Europe and there are some um, good, good examples from the UK as well. I think, and I've got a key collaborator in Finland um, who's done a, uh, some work in, I've done some electric aviation work with, and, and there are, you're getting a greater buy-in from people, which means you can then do a lot more um, in terms of um, 
I don't know if it's relevant here, but but certainly, and I know this from the UK, you have kind of fridge labels or environmental labels on different things. So that work in, in Finland is a separate piece of work, is, is looking at eco-labeling. So that could be a policy in terms of advancement that you're kind of encouraging people to look at flights based on um, environmental performance. So th there are changes in, in that. Um, there, are, there are also more detailed carbon calculations on the, the, the types of flight people are taking. So if you're on more efficient aircraft, there's less emissions per person. If you travel economy, smaller seats, um, but, but there's less emissions per person if you're traveling business class. And, and load factors um, are important, as I've said before. So, and there's different ways that you can adapt um, aircraft configuration. So, so there are some small em emission differences between that, which we're trying to look at, as well as a general um, avoiding travel. Um, how is Griffith investing in technology to replace travel for staff and students to connect? I think certainly um, the whole um, collaborate ultra teams um, and the way they link with with, win with Windows. Um, I'm not a core part of that development, but I certainly from I see Griffith as I wouldn't say a leading university in that area, but certainly not lag lagging behind in the general technology for for um, travel. I would like to see us become a leader. We may be in some parts of the university in terms of online conference delivery and development, um, and that would be great to see. Certainly, I've mentioned the dens, and there's been quite a bit of investment um, in in rooms on on the Gold Coast and the um, and at Nathan, particularly with the new N79 building. So I can see that investment. Um, I've probably got to say the sciences group, that money came from is my understanding, but certainly I, I think there has been some in that that kind of technology space. Um, and I've seen, excuse me, in terms of the, the room there where it's not just one screen, you have different screens, data sources you can use between each other. So um, there is some from Griffith and I'd hope there would be, um, be more. Again, there's, there's personal versus university views there. Um, will lingering COVID concern result in less willingness to fly and more willingness to participate virtually, especially for meetings? Yes, I, I think the whole COVID um, situation is going to be interesting to see and the whole um, travelling by air um, in, in a tight space confinement. You can see the challenges there and you see the industry coming out with um, better, the, the way the air goes through the aircraft as well. And I see different views on COVID, whether we get a vaccine in six months and then we'll get back to normal or whether COVID's here to stay and we, we just have um, social distancing to a certain degree and, and different um, vaccinations along the way. So it's hard to tell. Um, it, it's only going to result in a less of a willingness to, to fly. Um, I do think there'll be a pent up demand for air travel for leisure trips. Um, a lot of um, holidays being cancelled or pushed back. Work in the UK about um, household budgets under um, the GFC. I sense that people still prioritise their annual holiday. They still cut back on discretionary trips out when the budgets were hit with the recession, but they will still save up for their holiday. And that was shown in the UK where you, where you often have the summer sun destinations and people doing that. So I think there will be less willingness to fly, but countering that, there will be a pent up demand for certain types of trips. Um, when you're talking about carbon donations, does it actually go to the right places? Yes, that is certainly true with the offsetting. Um, how does Australia work on this concept? Um, there, are, there are accredited carbon offsetting organisations. I'm not aware of the Australia-wide carbon offsetting or environmental approach. Um, very good question and something I'm keen to look at um, in what we do. Um, Anonymous, more use of VR in lectures and conferences, definitely. Um, VR, AR, um, I'm not an expert in VR, AR, but certainly the way that Griffith is uh, researching and teaching the area is, is certainly le leading edge. Uh, in aviation, we have a new flight procedures laboratory opening in the new N79 next February uh, with uh, VR capability. And uh, we've got strong links with Boeing um, in, that, in that regard. And I know that people in ICT, um, I know Lee Ellen Potter's got a, got a VR lab and there are others doing VR AR work. So again, uh, Griffith is leading the research in that way and that's filtering into teaching. So 
Um, hopefully we can um, do that. We already use VR to some extent in our aviation teaching. And um, yeah, we, we need to push forward um, in that area. And actually we made a conscious decision um, as an aviation discipline, not to go down the full motion simulator, which is costly, which is more costly, um, short term benefits, but the longer term VR benefits is where we're going. Um, but certainly elsewhere in the university. Um, so very good point and um, very good approach. Um, and it was close to being on that slide about future technologies and it will certainly be in there moving forward. COVID travel limitations notwithstanding, how soon can we expect the university to begin to encourage staff to consider alternatives to frequent academic travel, um, especially time, cost and emissions travel? And how will this message be delivered? So there's, there, there's two things to that. There's one um, in the um, think about considerations and then the communication. Uh, my own view is um, that to um, is to try and get it to break down the, the, the conference and the meeting types, why they're going on it, and also what you're doing when you're there. Someone at a meeting a couple of days ago was saying about, well, online conferences, I'm not really fully engaged because I'm sitting there on my home computer doing, um, doing other work um, and less engaged. I've also felt less engaged in domestic conferences when people were traveling in because I was near my office and would dash back to other stuff. But I'm as guilty as anyone of being at an international conference, sitting in my hotel room and doing two hours of emails. So the, I, I, I want that message to get to think people thinking, well, of that air travel trip, what are the benefits I'm getting from it? And what type of work am I doing when we're there? Communication is important across different medium. One thing I've learned from communication in, in management is there's not one way of doing it. Um, there's verbal communication, email communication, newsletters, and from different sources as well. And I'm also aware of information overload that you can give people too many information and they switch off. So for me, message delivery is about different ways and different forms and just pitching it right as well. And I'm keen to get that balance between encouraging and forcing. Um, do you think there'll be a culture of flight shaming now and post COVID? Um, yes, there, there will be. I think the interesting from research perspective is how much that will um, that will grow um, beyond uh, North Scandinavia and the climate protests as well. Um, when when the, the protests currently are about um, Black Lives Matter and about um, other um, elements around COVID, um, the whole protest movement, how that changes, um, how the, the flight shaming movement. I see it as an undercurrent that will, will, will grow moving forward. I think the question is how much that will, that will come. There are certainly um, tipping points. Um, there's always a difference between when you get 5-10% doing it than when you get um, the so-called majority doing it and, and a general behaviour across. So, so that thinking from psychology is quite um, interesting. So my, my thought is that will only grow over time. So um, yeah, it, it's a very, very good point um, as well. And, and it also, when it filters down into social networks and social thing about, you, you get people um, sharing photos from business lounges and travel, um, and, and will they stop doing that and, and um, talk about the environmental impact of their travel and, and why they have to do it. So you'll get a lot of, um, lot of question marks over that. I'm conscious of time. Um, as expected, got some great questions, which I'm looking to take forward. Um, more expensive, yes, the price longer term is likely to go up because of the, the costs. Um, good to see positive about the dashboard. Um, I'm, I'm going, um, I think it's the serendipitous conversations at conferences um, are the ones that will be a real challenge. Um, those people that you didn't know before, that you suddenly link with um, are really um, important. Um, okay, good point, Cameron. Thank you very much. Um, great to have a nice thank you. Um, it, it is, um, I am really delighted to be leading this this work. Um, it's been one of my, my highlights of Griffith actually been able to, to take this previous research forward, but also seeing this at the heart of what Griffith is, is doing. Um, great to have an example, Cameron, from your question. Um, and it is very hard. It is hard. So, um, and I think the final one I'm looking at, um, yeah, mega conference weeks. It, it's interesting. Yeah, th th that's an interesting idea I've not come across before. But the whole element of, I know that with trimesters, 
um, and and when other international collaborators um, were uh, have their conferences, there's always different times of year which are good for someone in the UK. Um, July is good, whereas here it's the start of T2. So, so there are different timing of events. Um, one of the main conferences I used to go to was in the US and is now going online in January. But their um, eight hour event is between 10 o'clock midnight and uh, 10 o'clock here and four in the morning. So I can't really com get involved. So there's, there's a lot of interesting ideas coming forward. So I do like the idea of a conference festival and we'll see where, where that works. So that's a great comment to end on. Tracy, and thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone. I've really enjoyed it and I appreciate your time this morning.